is copper. So far, we've looked at the tea plant and the many types of tea it produces, along with the newest trends in tea. We travel back to the 17th century to examine the history of how tea arrived on these shores, which included the East India Company, the Opium Wars with China, empirical espionage, and the famous clipper ship tea races. So how did tea become synonymous with the English? Did it start as a genteel pastime along with cucumber sandwiches? What was the class difference and how and when did we change our attitudes to this humble beverage? Um, before I introduce my guest tonight, um, oops, I just want to remind people that they can, if they have questions at any point or any time, if they can put them in the chat box or in the Q&A below, that would be lovely um, and we'd appreciate that. So, to answer the questions and tell us so much more, we are joined by professional food historian and author Saren Caring, sorry, Charrington Hollands. Um, Saren has a great passion for the British tradition of tea drinking and her latest book, A Dark History of Tea, is very much a British history of this fascinating drink that delves into the very essence of why tea is such a, sorry, why well, tea is such a thriving tradition. Welcome Saren. Hello, hello. Beautiful backdrop. I love it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, yeah, it's my, my, actually, this is my office. Um, so um, it has many different changes depending on what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it seems to be lately mainly dedicated to tea. <laughs> Great. Look, I have to start with a mandatory question. So, how do you like your copper? Is it milk and lemon or? No, I'm afraid I like loose to leaf tea and um, and a good old teapot and nothing else in my tea. Um, occasionally, if I'm having something like an Earl Grey, I might have a slice of lemon, but generally, I just like my tea black. <laughs> so. <laughs> and how do you stand on dunking? Do you dunk a biscuit or not? Well, not 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 in public, but I do when I'm stuck here in the office on my own. I, I think um, actually there's a whole book in, in the art of dunking biscuits and what we should and shouldn't do. Um, but I do have to say I miss Abbey Crunch biscuits because they had great dunking ability. <laughs> so there you are. <laughs> great. Um, well, let's start off. What led you into food history? Um, I actually came from um, a medical herbalism background. Um, so I started giving talks actually on the history of uh, kill or cure really. Um, so looking at old apothecary recipes, looking at some of the recipes that dated back throughout history and giving quite amusing talks on, on the subject. And I just ventured more and more into the idea of um, how medicine and food crossed over and there are huge crossovers, as you, you'll be aware. Um, and I started to realise that I was giving more and more talks on food um, and, and concentrating very much on very often the Tudor still room um, than I was on anything else. Um, and gradually then the cookery demos came in. And by 2007, um, I was no longer doing apothecary talks and I don't think I've ever been asked to do another one since about 2007 and instead I was just doing really exclusively food. I mean essentially my, my role hasn't really changed because food, drink, medicine are all historically very much the same and there are huge crossovers so even in my book I'm there talking about chemists and apothecary um, so it's really interesting to have that background actually but my passion for a long time has been actually food and uh, food and drink. Um, I'm, I've always been what they would term foodie now, but uh, I, I just have a love of, of history. What's the most interesting part of your work? I think the lack of prediction, really. Um, I could certainly do with doing some tea leaf reading, I think in the morning to see what <laughs> might come up because I'll just give you today for a typical example. I've given a interview um, on microwave ovens and then straight after I gave a, an interview on edible flowers, um, I sort of scurried together to check that my PowerPoint for this evening did, did resemble what I was going to talk about. <laughs> 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 
days. And um, then I spoke to somebody um, who who runs a um, a disgusting food uh, museum. Um, because oh. uh, my next book um, is on disgusting foods, so through history or revolting foods, I should say, and about how revulsion is actually just a matter of taste, depending on your culture, depending on your perspective, depending on the actual period of history we're looking at. So it's just incredibly varied. Um, a few weeks ago, I was giving a Tudor cookery demonstration in this very room, um, and I was mixing up uh, quaking puddings and syllabub. You just never know, and I think that's the one thing about being multi-period. Um, the phone can ring, and, um, and we're talking about you know, retro puddings and whatever happened to, and then five minutes later, I'm back in that Tudor still room. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, for, yeah, like you said, there's many strands, many crossovers. Uh, so I guess it's you can continue to explore and explore. There's so much. So let's get on to tea. Um, so we know from last week that tea was a highly sought after commodity. And when it first became available in Britain, it's extremely expensive. So can you explain from then how it became popular? Who had it first? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, tea um, originates um, from China, um, and I, I won't go into that 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 global history because I know you've covered these. Um, but it was, needless to say, it was you know a very rare and exotic leaf. Um, and I think we tend to think because we, we love tea so much and we are now considered a nation of of tea drinkers. I mean, indeed, it's British uh, tea. Uh, tea day today so um, you know we, we, it's just so synonymous now with British culture um, I mean here I sit actually with my own cup of tea in, in, in a tea cup and you know I just think you know we, we have things like English breakfast tea and that states an awful lot about how ingrained it is um, just it means so much to us um, and I don't think there's a situation um, in life that, you know, a cup of tea doesn't raise its head. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a time for celebration or something terrible has happened, some disaster. You know, the first thing is I'll put the kettle on and make a cup of tea. And that's a very British thing. <laughs> and I think for that reason, we sort of think that tea's always been there. And of course it hasn't. When it came over, um, which we'll get onto in a, a little while about the records for it. But we didn't immediately go, oh, tea, that's wonderful. We love this. No, no, uh, we, we, we adopted a very British stance on it. And this was a foreign, exotic um, substance that we just didn't trust. We just didn't embrace. It was a very strange, alien sort of thing. Um, I think we've always been a little suspicious of continental trends, and that's just the way that we are. And we can trace this back in many food and drink. Um, so, you know, it's amazing how we've become such a nation of, of tea drinkers during this initial suspicion. And the records actually indicate that um, tea didn't actually appear in England until 1657. Um, and it was first sold in um, the, the Sultaness Head, um, which was at the Royal Exchange, and that was sold in, in 1658. Um, and I think it's quite interesting because going back to 1600, the East India Company had had a monopoly on importing all exotic goods. Now, when we look at the East India Company, we do again, um, and they will crop up a bit later in this talk, no doubt, but we just think of the tea implications and we maybe think of the tea auctions. But my goodness, I mean, they imported everything and anything that was exotic. Um, so, you know, I've got some fabulous uh, photographs in my, my personal collection of giant sponges, um, of ostrich feathers. I've got some wonderful um, illustrations, which unfortunately they just didn't scan in very well for this. Um, but they just are amazing. Their warehouses were full of um, exotic wines, um, spices, um, ostrich feathers, ivory, all sorts of things which at that time were incredibly valuable and um, 
in incredibly sought after. Yeah. And the fact that this India company get involved with tea tells you that this was something a exotic and B was going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. and they got very interested in that. And um, in terms of it becoming popular over here, I mean, we had had um, coffee houses um, established, and I think um, being established 1652 was the first coffee house we had. And right. um, so the, the trend of enjoying, um, you know, coffee was, was by this stage quite established by the you know, that he's, he's um, coming on to the picture. But it wasn't really until Charles II uh, got married and he took a Portuguese bride. And she was what I would call the original tea addict. Okay. <laughs> um, so she comes along. And just like today, if a celebrity endorses something and, and or, or a royal... I know I would say celebrity now for us because we tend to take more of a lead from celebrities because of the way that our media works and, sure. and things. But in looking back, you know, the royalty were the ones and the aristocracy were the ones that were setting the trends. And so he takes um, Catherine uh, of Braganza as his wife and she wants to drink tea and it becomes a fashion thing to do she not only um introduces us to tea drinking but also tea ceremony you know the idea of it being something that wasn't just like we would think of today of dunking a tea bag in a mug but this was actually you know something very refined and very interesting and of course then wealthy uh wealthy classes suddenly latched onto this idea and this is the fashionable in thing to do and the east india company immediately jump on this and go we're going to capitalize on this and the first order placed uh for tea in 1664 by um by the east india company was actually for a hundred pounds of tea oh. in weight yeah. so that's a lot and and you know um and it, it was shipped from java and you know then the enthusiasm for tea is just going to mount now like all things it didn't suddenly become the thing and nobody objected it sees many waves um you know and just like today, some of us will decide we're tea drinkers, some are coffee drinkers, some don't drink any. Um, so, you know, that, that's the way we are. But it became a really very popular drink. And it became a popular drink in the coffee houses. Um, and I think that it becomes something that's synonymous with relaxation, with pleasure. And then as it progresses, also with politics. <laughs> so we'll keep that little bit. But this is not widespread amongst the, the working class. It's too expensive. It's not something working classes can get a hold of. At this point, we're looking at there's two types of tea. We're looking at green tea and bohi tea. And bohi tea is the black, cheaper tea. But it doesn't matter which type you have um, because it's still expensive. We can't really afford if you're a lower class, either type of tea, even the black uh, low heat tea. If you look at old tea teas, the two mixing bowls, it's because you've got green and black tea. And um, it became fashionable for ladies of the house to mix their own particular blend. And, you know, whether they knew what they were doing is a matter, but it looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> so, yes. Um, yes. So um, I think basically the East India Company after um, you know some some time mm -hmm. this has become very popular and this is when we start seeing tea as becoming actually a very sociable activity and it becomes a vehicle um, for sociability it becomes something that you can do through seduction you know that becomes a big thing um, because you've got ladies very involved with this. And uh, as you're probably aware, the social restrictions um, upon women in particular, um, I mean, even if you look at courtship, there were just 
so many restrictions mm-hmm. and women weren't allowed to socialize outside um, of, of one another's homes and um, she actually um, gave some freedom and, and I, this wasn't something that was initially thought but it's certainly something that um, became um, a, a real vehicle for women to get a little bit of freedom um but before was, we, we oh, sorry sorry yeah no i was just going to say was was it the victorians then it was like boom time for them or was that when the tea became really popular and we saw tea gardens or well it's it's the 18th century um really that that britons wanted to drink tea it has by this stage just become that we really want to drink tea. It's so fashionable and everybody wants tea. Mm. And the problem was with this, we might have wanted tea, but we couldn't necessarily get tea because mm-hmm. the high prices were. But this doesn't mean that the lower classes didn't start to get tea. Um, because what happens with everything is we've got high taxation going on, really high taxation. And it was 25 pence in the pound. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the exact figures because I've got them down here, actually. Um, 18, 1689, it was 25 pence in the pound and it almost stopped sales. So that, that's the point of it. Um, it was so expensive that just nobody wanted to buy it. At that amount is so, so prohibitive. Mm. Um, so they actually reduced it. In 1692, it goes down to five pence tax in the pound okay. um actually, i mean this is not nothing nothing that was you know it, it actually it's only in 1964 that we stopped tea tax so <laughs> 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 what do you mean? and when you consider that you think 1964 goodness so it's just yeah. you know this has been something that's been going on for for decades and centuries this taxation of tea because it's so expensive two things happened right. one was that people said well, we'll smuggle the tea in. And so tea and smuggled. And the other thing was adulteration. And there are some wonderful recipes for adultering tea. And the first one was, well, we'll put other leaves in, just random things we find, anything we can we can do. Right. Um, but that could be detected. And so twigs and leaves and things, you could really tell. But then if you started putting things like cheap brand in it, which was a was actually an additive to it, and uh, things like that. It darkened it, they dye it to try and get the right colour. Um, it's actually one of the things. Adulteration was one of the big things that the British used when we wanted to switch from importing tea from China, mm-hmm. and we wanted to start importing tea from our own Indian plantations that we set up. We actually used adulteration as a very good argument. And we said, you know, all this green tea is adulterated. <laughs> Black tea we imported. I mean, that was adulterated. It didn't stop it. <laughs> if something happens, there's always an incentive, isn't there, to, to have criminal activity going on. So, I mean, smuggling went on. Uh, copper carbonate was, was uh, added to, to make it look uh, more like tea. Yeah. She drank, oh, you know, I mean, it went into the tea. Um, but by 1784, the government realised that, you know, enough is enough, right? You know, this not a taxation is mm-hmm. causing more problems than it's worth. You know, we've got major issues going on here. So it was actually Prime Minister William Pitt. And he said, right, you know, um, I'm going to slash tax. It's going to go from 119% down to 12.5%. And that's huge, isn't it? That's absolutely huge. Mm-hmm. And now there's no incentive for anybody to have adulterated or smuggled tea um, because legal tea is just suddenly affordable and accessible. So that's really your point, 1784. Mm-hmm. When that happens, that's when the floodgates um, and the teapots really open <laughs> because <laughs> now we the board it. Um, and so... And this then brings on board that, you know, with all of this happening, tea is now so much about sociability. It's now going to open up all sorts of things. So 18th centuries onwards, um, we really start um, looking at sociable teas, chit chat. 
you know, and this is where we start opening up tea gardens and things. But the, the first stage would be when we look at how tea becomes, shall we say, a little risque, um, is that it is this idea of chit chat. Women um, before could only really entertain at home. Um, and so in the beginning, you know, they, they are still doing this. And tea, there's, there's two types of tea. There's tea with food uh -huh. and there's tea without. And the tea without food is just designed for you just to have a little chat. But this yeah. also lends itself to being able to actually entertain gentlemen for a little chat and oh. actually get to uh, perhaps have a little chat that may have some romantic connotations. <laughs> and let's, let's remember that what we may consider absolutely nothing today, you know, would be, um, you know, frowned upon. So even though these may have been attended by many people, the idea of, uh, you know, a, a lady and gentleman sitting together being able to chat over a cup of tea was, mm -hmm. was in many respects rather um, scandalous. Uh, you know, and um, and tea gardens sprung up, and and these became absolutely notorious for acts that we won't talk about in polite society. <laughs> um, let's the upper, and, yeah, exactly. I mean, the upper and middle classes just wandered the promenades lined with flower beds, and the families uh, sort of flocked. You know, to what hot air balloons, and it sounds spectacular. I mean, these these pleasure gardens yeah. um, just are a fabulous idea, and uh, you know, and if you look at the illustrations of them, they just look beautiful. And I can see there's an illustration up at the moment, and um, but they're all dancing, and it looks a little a sort of um, rebellious, shall we say, and a little you know uh, loose and, and yes. free. And that's the problem because whilst we look at the wonderful respectful images of, of which there are many uh -huh. uh, that have for time these, these lovely uh, tea gardens of them wandering up and down all in their finery uh -huh. there was another side and the other side was that aristocrats um were actually uh, committing cbd shall we say uh, in wooded corners and shady shady patches of the pleasure <laughs> garden and they just allowed people of different backgrounds to actually mingle and so you'd actually get professionals you'd get aristocrats and you'd get um you know lower classes actually entering um and even charging an admission fee uh, which was the idea at Box of Gardens was that, well, we're charging admission fee and this would stop the riffraff. Well, it didn't because it was absolutely rife with pickpockets and prostitutes. Okay. And this is the reality of it. Um, so despite the shilling entrance fee, uh, Vauxhall just had a complete reputation of debauchery. And um, so, you know, this glut of wooded areas just allowed lots of secret activities. And so very well-dressed prostitutes actually, you know, uh, frequented the gardens. And these, they created little tea areas where you could take tea and it could all be very respectable. But these were actually just, um, whilst I'm sure there were some very respectable people there enjoying their tea, it just became actually that the tea gardens became um, synonymous with other activities and well, certainly okay. sorry yeah. I guess I guess a pleasure has all sorts of connotations the word pleasure so you could have a pleasure just sipping your tea or on the more romantic uh, sexual side or whatever was going on and I'm sure the pickpockets were getting pleasure from easy pickings I think so, I think so. <laughs> and also you know the tea gowns that were in fashion at this time and this was only for in the house so if you were taking tea at home they actually became very loose fitting and we've got some wonderful illustrations I think of some yeah. lovely uh, tea gowns um, you know the fashions were very uh, much about um, you know uh, flaunting as it was seen then because you've got to imagine the very heavily corseted dresses and very mm -hmm. uh, to fashion these were loose these were loose fitting, these were soft. And um, actually, you know, that idea of it being very soft and very loose and very easy access was what um, <laughs> I was saying. 
Uh, this was also seen as, you know, the height of absolute, you know, this is, this is something that's rather risky. Yeah. And so he just takes on a whole seduction idea through tea gowns, through loose, loose fitting tea gowns, through the idea that, um, I mean, in my book, I've, I've actually got a whole section on this where, you know, a lady could be at home to receive a gentleman friend for tea and, and be fully available. And this was this was the fear at the time when we were publishing magazines. And, yeah. You can imagine, actually, it must have been wonderful because like we, we saw there in the earlier picture where the men and the women, and as you said, they're quite loose and enjoying themselves and having a rare old time, that it must have been wonderful because it was so restricted, as you said, up till then. It's like a chance for men. And who doesn't like going out, socialising and mixing with men and women? It's only the social structures of the day that kind of cause that. But we are, as humans, we like to communicate, to socialise, to dance and let go. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, now, if, if these things existed, um, you know, and, and there was dancing going on and, and things, nobody would blink an eye. But I, I think, you know, um, looking back at then, and of course, because things were so restricted, of course, the tea gardens um, were sort of pounced upon with, with great enthusiasm as, as an outlet. You know, um, in those days as well, um, um, there were things like the coffee houses of the time were very popular, but you had people like Mole King, for example, um, that was operating with Tom King, King's Coffee House, which, which essentially um, was a, a, a house of ill repute. So it was a, it was a brothel, <laughs> an illicit gambling den and all sorts of things. So um, in a way, um, you know, you can see why tea was being seen by some as becoming uh, a moral blight and that it was replacing gin as a moral blight. So wow. sort of see tea. Um, and this is where we get the changing attitude about tea because, you know, initially we've got this expensive, exotic um, herb coming over and it's, uh, you know, highly respectable and highly sought after because it's being drunk by royalty and aristocracy and everybody's loving the idea. We can't get hold of it. It's very expensive. Um, it's really only for the gentry classes to enjoy because of the price. We get all sorts of uh, smuggling and, uh, you know, adulteration. We sort all that out and suddenly the floodgates open for tea. Then comes in the moral, raging moral debate about, A, is this got really curative um, powers and is it any good for you? But the more important one is it's safe for the genteel classes to drink, but it's indulgent and it's morally dangerous uh, for those of lower classes to indulge in. And um, there's huge moral risks, as you can imagine, for women. <laughs> so, so basically, you know, we, we, we need to be incredibly careful about this. And this is the great fight that goes on. And uh, it's the sort of really, I think this is the biggest debate next to the taxation debate. <laughs> so we get over taxation and we've got the next thing. And it's a curious argument. Yeah, so it's quite an elitist thing, but it's um, it's for many different things, whether it's tea or tattoos or things that are like um, adopted by the uh, aristocracy and the upper middle classes. And then this whole, as you say, debate whether you could have it, you know, the, mm -hmm. the rest of the people, the, um, the working class, could they handle it? You know, it, because if they can handle it, it's like it takes away the exotic and the specialness of it, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think so. I think there was some of this. And I think also, if we look at the, the image that's up at the moment, and this is for Maypole tea, and, and it says, um, and this is 1899, it says a perfect little tease. And you look at the image that's going on um, and, um, and you can see, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lovely image. I just love this, this particular advert. But there's a lot of things coming into the music halls at this time that are actually uh, about it. They, they use tea um, and they basically suggest the risky nature 
And of course, this is uh, days when we've got gaiety. And so it's all, you know, great entertainment. But for some people, you know, in positions um, where, where they are concerned about, as we say, our economic force. So they're worried about these workers, you know, our workforce and our lower classes actually getting carried away and lounging around all day drinking tea um, and brilliant um, <laughs> you know how dare they i mean this is not what they should be doing you know lounging around this is something that the gentry classes can afford to actually lay about drinking tea but you know it's morally indulgent we can't have our working classes and our women you know sitting down drinking tea this is not what they're supposed to be doing I so see. it's uh, that, uh, women of um, a working class background haven't got the uh, aptitude or, or the moral backbone to understand that they can't spend all the money on tea um, and as a result they would be starving their children you know depriving their husband of a nutritious meal because they have sat about all day drinking copious amounts of tea and these were real arguments that were coming in in fact I've, I've got a quote here which I'll just quickly say um it was said um that typically they were not concerned about continuing popularity of tea um but it was the strength of labor that was the issue and um it, it's actually said by so many reformers and the debate uh, raged and it was the Dean of Bangor, actually, and I'll just um, I'll just get this little quote for okay. you. Great, I mean, I actually got it in my book, and yeah. it's the Dean of Bangor, and he just absolutely uh, takes that this is worse than than anything. So here he is: excessive tea drinking creates a generation of nervous, historical, discontented people, always complaining of the existing order of the universe, scolding their neighbours and sighing after the impossible. Cooking of more solid substances would, I firmly believe, enable them to take a far happier and correct view of existence. So he was worried that it would challenge social classes. And, and that was the Dean of Anger. And he, he just basically, I mean, he doesn't, he's not on his own on this, but he doesn't stop. There are pages of his, his worries. And he's worried about nutrition. He's worried that the lower classes can't handle it. And as you saw there, he's very worried that they'll start to challenge the hierarchy. Um, right. so and that, that's that sounds like what it, the, the main thing, the thrust of that is, is, um, and that sort of, like I said before, the elitism and also they're getting above their station. You know, you had to know where you were. They didn't want any blurring of the lines because that, again, would take down their stature, I guess. Did, did the advertising, like we saw there, did the tea, um, the advertising use the curative properties as a selling point as well? Yeah, they did. I mean, um, there, there are some interesting arguments. For tea, looking uh, through the generations. I mean, even looking into actually uh, the later stages of tea in the 60s and 70s, tea advertising is interesting. But historically, um, we start off with the exoticism of tea. Um, and that's from coming over of China and it's going to be very good for you. Um, and it's actually said that it's good for the nerves, it's good for, you know, calming hysteria. The opposite argument, of course, is that it causes hysteria. <laughs> but, but, but the advertisers were there saying this is a very good thing to be drinking. When we actually go over to our Indian um, tea plantations, we then come over at the great British tea. Um, and that's when we really say this is imperial. This is the British tea. And that's where that element is coming because the marketers are very clever. And we have all sorts of wonderful um, images, both of people picking tea leaves. Um, so you have the, the exotic element coming in of someone very calmly, very peacefully picking these tea leaves. And it all looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the reality was, was something very different, sure. but it all looks beautiful. Um, but then you've also got statues of, of an empire tea. And it's there's just, you know, you are supporting the empire. And to be British is to drink tea. And that's what it really says to you through these adverts. And you just can't get away from that. 
you want to be British and upstanding, drink tea. And that's what they say to you <laughs> very clearly. So are we maybe coming into the politics of tea as well? Um, there, um, <clears throat> I mean, the links between tea and the women's suffrage and the temperance movement. What can you tell us about that? Absolutely. I mean, they, again, um, it being a very genteel tradition, um, women, I mean, 19th century uh, women, you know, could actually attend suffrage meetings through a vehicle of tea. And it's quite simple. We're looking at the first Lions Tea Room open in uh, 1894. And this suddenly allowed women to go out of the house and meet in a public place and, you know, drink tea um, because tea is pretty harmless. You couldn't go and drink tea in a house. You couldn't go and take a drink in a public house or a coffee house because this is frequented by men. You know, Lion's Tea Rooms just did this wonderful thing. And I, I always think of them as those wonderful gold emblazoned frontages, you know, with all the, the writing on. And they just look so, um, they, look, they look so refined, actually. And they look very ordered. And there's something in that that this was respectable. This was somewhere as a woman. I could go and meet you and have a cup of tea. Actually, without a chaperone, and what a wonderful, liberating thing. And of course, I mean, just diverting a little bit because we're going to get back onto suffering. You know, Nippy's worked there. And these are the wonderful black and white uniformed uh, women who um, actually served, you know, the tea. And they were actually very sought after, actually, as, as marriage partners. They were really sought after, <laughs> but there's another tale. Um, but the thing is that this was a place where women worked and women served women and that's so it's a female dominated and when we look at the suffrage movement mm -hmm. actually in some of the adverts we say they actually say it's women only you know so this mm -hmm. is completely new we've never had women only before we've always had women and excluded women not allowed you know men only but yes. we've not had women and so this was uh, absolutely wonderful and um there are many many uh places we had, uh, obviously, as I say, the Lions Tea Rooms, and there were many of them. We had um, the Café Vegetaria, uh, which uh, hosted the Women's Freedom Society. Um, and uh, we had Parker's Café over in Manchester. We also had Harrods um, Café. We had all sorts of places. And so this suddenly became somewhere that women could suddenly take um, tea, and discuss what was happening to them. Now before, and there's a picture up here of Mole King, and we mentioned Mole King, interesting, pastamonger originally, um, you know, a, a woman to be reckoned with. And um, she, she ran, yeah, she did. I mean, you know, I mean, she was um, in and out of court and knew her way round. Um, she got in and married um, Tom King and they ran a coffee house. But she um, essentially, um, you know, was not one that have, would have been uh, peddling any sort of Lions Tea Room operation. She was a woman who was very much a force to be reckoned with and very much in control of what she was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was more into the exploitation, shall we say, or the recruitment of women than she was into the liberation. <laughs> so it was still, although it was run by a man, it was a very male dominated mm -hmm. um, environment. It wasn't somewhere that a respectable woman could have actually visited, although run by a woman. Whereas these tea rooms, you know, and I, I, an advert here um, says dainty lunches and afternoon teas at moderate charges, home cookery, vegetarian dishes and sandwiches, entirely staffed by women. And that was um, a, an advert um, and it was advertised in Votes for Women um, and it's Clement Singh. And so this is a completely different thing. We've had things run by women, we've had women in business and we've had women serving, but we have never had anywhere before that's respectable, that women nice. of um, a, you know, a respectable nature could say, well, you know, I'm going to go and take tea and I can actually do this. Um, and so 
you know, even the fact that you've got places like Harrods actually allowing, you know, these teas for women right. um, and self reduces is something very new. This is not somewhere where people could say, oh, my goodness, you know, she's visiting somewhere of ill repute. This mm -hmm. is respect. I mean, and again, it worried people. <laughs> OK. And yes, of course, it would, because, um, again, with women, the same thing as we were saying about the working classes, they might get above their station and really, you know, that, you know, keeping them down, keeping the restraints on them was the order of the day. Um, I just wondered as well, um, some of the earlier pictures um, of the of the people drinking tea was they looked very jolly and like revelry and stuff going on so was there more in the tea than just tea i know you said they put different things yeah. to make it up but yeah, was yeah, there they, um well there was um, <laughs> it has to be said that the term cold tea actually referred to gin oh. this is a little later so i mean it's i, I actually um I remember speaking to somebody when I was researching my book and they actually said to me about the term cult and I knew exactly what they meant but it was about the person I spoke to to was advancing in in years and they were referring about their grandmother but it was the idea of actually having something that was less respectable in your teacup um, so you could be sitting there with your teacup and actually drinking gin and, and this actually leads into the idea that obviously there had been a big problem and a big campaign against strong liquors because strong liquors were undoubtedly a huge problem and so we get the whole temperance movement coming in and sobriety and so tea was suddenly seen as a respectful thing so although people were worried about the gaiety of tea and about the freedom that tea was giving and about women getting above their station and drinking and the working classes getting above their station and drinking tea for goodness sake you know getting ideas yeah. um it was also by some that well you know what tea's not a bad thing because tea is a much better idea than drinking hard liquor because this is the thing that snatches parents away from children causes neglect and, and sucks life away i mean because again gin in those days was not like the gin we're thinking of. It was very rough gin. Mm. It could be a built very strong as well, you know, bathtub gin. So this was not good. And, you know, I mean, I think we're all familiar with the Hogarth sketch of, of gin and the gin palaces that were going on. Mm -hmm. I think we had 7,000 dram shops in London at one point. Wow. So, you know, gin. so tea was sort of actually seen as, as the substance of salvation. Mm -hmm. And so you do see throughout that there are many um, sort of campaigns to get people sober and get them drinking tea. And again, I think this is where we sort of then through those campaigns get the idea of tea becoming very respectable. So it actually stops being something that's to do with, um, you know, wealth and, 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 and flamboyance and things. And it actually actually moves into being things that we think of tea and sympathy. Okay. I think this is where it's actually threading through because now we do, we say tea and sympathy, you know, and, and if someone is upset or somebody is in a bad way, it's perfectly acceptable to give them a cup of tea. If you went into hospital and had an operation, the first thing you're offered is a cup of tea. Yes. Uh, you know, so that, that sort of idea. And it's because it's seen as actually a method of salvation there were many talks given on tea and again tea linked in and it's funny linked in with some of the vegetarian campaigns and there were many campaigns done saying that actually eating flesh um was not that good because it was um enraging people you know and and um causing people to be very aggressive and it wasn't good and it was and kind of so we've got the vegetarian society and those movements coming up We've got okay. women's politics coming up and they're all finding their way through tea. <laughs> it's quite interesting. <laughs> very. It becomes very respectable and, um, and very sober. Yes, and in the in these tea rooms that then they could go to, the women were getting together and was that still very much a class thing or were they able to mix? 
I think um, where you see it is that um, it tends to be, I mean, it did have certainly the work, I mean, Lion's Tea Room was at that stage very upper class. Um, you've certainly got sort of Harrods and Selfridges and things, it's very upper class. Yeah. But um, there were lower class tea rooms springing up that were more, and they weren't lower class, they were just more accessible right. because they were cheap. Um, so um, the Air 80 Bread um, Company, they they actually come out with a tea, tea room and that's a little bit more of a, uh, a, a lower class tea room in terms of cost. But also um, they could meet up in village halls and they often did meet up the lower classes who wanted to actually, um, you know, discuss and, um, you know, campaign and plan campaigns, um, you know, for the votes for women, met in church halls, met in, you know, uh, sort of places that they could rent and drank tea. <laughs> so, you know, it, that's that thing. So there was something for everybody through the vehicle of tea, which right. is great. And um, I mean, you know, now if we even look at village halls and things, no village hall is complete without tea. <laughs> so. No, it's still it's still the same, and I know it's the same in my country too. It's uh, tea is the order of the day when it comes down to things like that. Just because most people will drink it and like it. Um, let's go over so um, the opium dens because this is still related to tea. So if uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. Oh, there we are. Um, so. Tea, obviously, um, we, I know you've discussed in a, a previous mm -hmm. week about the triangle uh, that was going on. And so I'm just going to briefly get over that so I can explain how we get opium dens in, in London. Yeah. So essentially what you've got is a position of when the British wanted tea from China, China sort of said, well, you know, what have you got to trade with? And we suggested cloth, um, but the Chinese didn't want our heavy cloths because we've got a very different climate. So our cloths were seen as inferior. They're very heavy. Uh, we're, we're going with, with linen and um, flannel and woolens. And it's like, no, we, we don't want that type of cloth. We've got fine silks. A very interesting <laughs> silks. Um, and they do, they do come over here. Um, but they say, what have you got? And the only thing we've got is silver. So that's fine to begin with. Um, but of course, the, the wonderful uh, East India Company have the monopoly. Um, and it comes to a point where basically they no longer, and, and, and the British um, establishment no longer want to part with the silver. So, they look at the East India Company also has another monopoly, which is on opium. And they actually have the monopoly on opium in India, grown in India. So they look at China already has a liking, shall we say, for opium. There is a desire that is a desirable commodity. It is strictly banned <laughs> from entering. Mm -hmm. uh, China, but um, Britain uh, just sort of doesn't see that as an obstacle. <laughs> so, although the British government and indeed the East India Company had no direct trade of opium for tea, what essentially happens is they uh, uh, they export the um, opium from India to China. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and silver comes back into England for the opium and goes back to China for tea. So it's a triangle. So essentially, although it may not be a absolute direct, and it is done very much through uh, officials in China that are willing to take a backhand and willing to make a cut, and, and it's all done in a very shady way. Yes. And the illustration you have up there exactly says what is, <laughs> is looked at is that we forced opium on the Chinese. Now, of course, the, there is a way of looking at it. If, if people didn't want it, it wouldn't have existed. But of course, it caused a huge problem in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, it destroyed, um, as they saw it, they, it was destroying their economy. It was destroying their culture yeah. because basically 
there was so much opium there and it became very cheap and very accessible. And this was men and women were actually smoking opium and opium became a huge problem over there. The thing is, of course, that when anything like this is going on, they, this opium also found its way back was in England and there are actually reports where at the docks opium was being readily unloaded you know it wasn't under the cover of darkness this was being unloaded with the rest of the cargo so we've got fine silks we've got tea and we've got opium now this is on I mean we can't comprehend this today at all because this just would seem so strange mm -hmm. but what you have to also consider is that we had opium available all the time you could go to any chemist and you could just jot out a few minor formalities um, and you could obtain all sorts of um, what we would consider class A substances or very dangerous yeah. substances. Yeah. Opium. yeah. Well, um, this was put in cough mixture. This was put in um, things to help with teething for babies. It was in so many things and it was seen as a mother's aid in yeah. these i mean unfortunately some of these little uh you know innocents did go to sleep and never wake again right. but we also set up opium dens now um this actually it, there's two ways of looking at it one is that the opium was coming in so it was available we've also got sailors uh, and people that have developed because they've been going back and forth to, to china and they picked up the habit of opium um and you know so the opium then spring up and it's port towns it's not everywhere it's the, the port city right. but that's where it's bringing up it, it was basically i mean the papers got hold of this new york also had a problem with this and um in some of the sketch um you know articles if you go back there's some wonderful images um and of them and you never know these are illustrated so you never quite know what artistic license was given to this sure. you know and we have to consider that because you know dramatization and scandal i mean it's no different to today but it's certain that some opium dens did spring up in London and other port um, cities. And it was then linked to prostitution, um, you, you know, and you can see where it's going. The thing yeah. is that opium certainly became readily available and there were certainly those that were addicted. Um, it also caused issues because in a lot of the illustrations they showed, um, you know, uh, Chinese and it, it all became a little bit that suddenly the British did blame actually uh, um you know yeah. people coming in rather than it being an actual problem with what was going on with tea two things at that time weren't linked together that has to be said yes so tea retained its respectability and um, certainly I mean opium was a huge problem in Britain and um, perhaps not visibly seen at the time you know there, there was the awareness of some opium dens um mm -hmm. but certainly through opium being available in chemists and, and mixtures you know um you know mixed up substances yes. you know was used and it did cause a lot of infant mortality um baby farmers who uh, mm -hmm. basically would buy your baby would often take the fee um, okay. You know, so you you put the advert and they'd say, um, "Good home," you know, for a baby. Mm -hmm. You pay them a sum of money to take your child to give it a better home. They'd often just dispense you know, an opiate for it and take the fee. Um, so there were all sorts of things. Many girls were also lured into prostitution through right. the use of opiate. Yeah, it's a oh, darker side to it. Definitely. Well, look, because um, I'm aware we're moving on rather fast <laughs> we haven't got a lot of time left so as your book suggests tea in britain has a very dark history sorcery and even murder so oh, yeah. can you tell us about that please Make yeah well sense. i mean as i said we love a scandal don't we in this yeah. um, <clears throat> and i think it's every country actually um but tea has been a vehicle for murder and um there's been some criminal trials and um and it's quite interesting actually nobody has actually um sort of thought of tea in this way i don't think but i think the most famous one would be uh, mary ann cotton and uh they thought that she claimed up to 21 lives through her arsenic filled teapot 
Um, and so uh, basically, I mean, her teapot is, is actually on display in a museum. Um, and it's, it, it just looks quite an innocent looking teapot. Um, but the only person she got convicted of was the murder of her stepson, Charles Edward. But essentially anyone that stood in her way got suspicious of her or she didn't like. She killed off by offering them a cup of tea. Right. Of course, it wasn't the tea, the arsenic contained. But you wouldn't suspect because even now, if you went to someone's home and they said, you know, would you like a cup of tea? You wouldn't think of being um, killed off by arsenic, you know, um, in the teapot. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, forensics weren't what they were, but they did find that arsenic in the teapot. And uh, so there you are, she, she killed people off. Um, I mean, when we think about um, also, and, and there she is, uh, Mrs. Cotton, I mean, she doesn't look the type, does she really? But then there's the teacup poisoner. And um, and that's what he was he was nicknamed. Um, and actually, he started as a young boy um, of fourteen. Um, and I, I just find it quite strange. His name is Graham Young, and you know, fourteen years of age, and he becomes very interested in toxicology. And I mean, goodness, he could have been a great asset to us, couldn't he? Because he had a real grasp of toxicology. He um, starts experimenting with poisoning people um, and he does it through the vehicle of tea. And he actually um, admits, um, and this is back in the 60s, he admits to, in, in 1962, to murdering his stepmother through tea. So he poisons her tea. Um, he doesn't actually get, um, uh, uh, you know, convicted of the murder. He gets actually put in the maximum security hospital of Broadmoor. So that's where he goes. Um, but he's 14 years of age. So he's the youngest person that, that Broadmoor ever had. Um, but he doesn't stop there because eventually he comes out. Um, he's released and he goes and gets a job in a lab. Oh. Uh, and uh, we can guess what happens next, really, because he actually, there are a number of people over the period that he works there that begin to die. And he makes all the tea and he's always, and it was reported at the time that he was very keen to make the tea. So he poisoned them again through mugs of tea. Eventually right. he get, does get caught. Um, but that, that's the thing. And I think what's interesting is, um, if we look at somebody like the last um, woman that was um, convicted, uh, well, tried, not convicted, but tried for witchcraft, was in 1944, and that was Helen Duncan. Now, uh, she had very little to do with tea, other than <laughs> what I would say about her is um, she was either a very, very, uh, you know, gifted lady, uh -huh. or she was fraud and that was what was was suggested at the time and she used to do seances and she communicated uh with spirits etc um she actually did serve serve a sentence you know um and, and it was over it was actually she served a sentence under a very ancient law you know so we're, we're going back to witchcraft laws which are no longer in oh, place okay the interesting thing is she would have these uh, tea parties and they would say on this. So she'd invite people around for tea and they it would you know they'd have these say, say on this and things. But I think the thing is, I mean, we, we have this with a lot of um things through history. There have been so many people um that have used tea mm -hmm. as as a vehicle for you know come round and have some tea yeah. and you know contact the dead and you know or come round and have tea and, and we'll read tea leaves. Right. And, and I'm absolutely fascinated by the idea of how tea um you know that has come into tea leaf reading and um i've actually got the, the book here uh -huh. uh, that you can see over on your screen and in the back of this this is actually dreams and how to read your destiny from a cup and and this is a well late 1920s book um and actually in here um it gives all sorts of things so if you see a zebra in your tea cup uh, then you're going to have foreign travel or or adventures. Um, whereas if you've got a wheel, it's money and property or a legacy. Um, but you know, if you see um, a, a thistle, you've got hardships and crosses. 
to right. bear. And there's, there's absolutely masses of them, you know. And the interesting thing is that actually, I, I've actually written a whole section on cassiography and what it means. Right. And it's interesting to think that we've got people murdering, we've then got people doing divination through tea, <laughs> yeah. and, and we've got the whole sort of almost sort of fortune telling element going on and it you know and it's tea so you know you think well hang on it's gone from being an exotic herb um it's then come as a, a political vehicle mm -hmm. and now they're sat around at home having our tea leaves read okay. and it's so fascinating the different um uh things that can be seen in your tea i know whenever i do tea leaf reading you know people are always fascinated they always read mine read mine you know what's yeah. this say um <laughs> But of course, you've got to got to use traditional tea leaves. But it's absolutely fascinating that you know, from murder to fortunes. You know, the fortune of your your you know really does lie in the bottom of your cup. You know, or can. Yeah. And do I'm actually just on that um, before we finish off the the reading of the tea leaves um, for you is it something just fun? Do but do people take it very seriously? Yeah, they do. I mean, people take it very, very seriously. My my view on uh, tassiography mm -hmm. is that, like um, all um, ways of, uh, you know, if you do scrying or, or anything like that, it's really in the intuition within it. Right. So there is a certain skill to it, um, and it, it's it's uh, very interesting, you know. And I've read a lot of very old books on it. I've got quite a collection actually of these these books, and they are interesting. But I think it's very much uh, based upon uh, the idea because uh, of intuition, and, and it's in the reader, really, rather than just switching it around. But the thing about tea leaf reading, unlike other forms of um, divination, mm -hmm. is that it only does a very, um, so it only does 24 hours really. So oh. you were only looking, why it was popular in parlours and things. And um, it was very popular with love and, and finding out whether you'd marry or, or what your love associated would be, or very homely. So all of the um, readings that are done and all the books I've ever read on it are all to do with very mundane, very homely activities. Whereas if you look at other types of um, fortune telling and, and divination, they have a wider scope, um, whereas these are very, you know, you might travel, you you, you might have hardship or luck or, or, <laughs> or, you know, you might meet somebody. And I think that's that tells you a lot about the position of tea and it being a very homely, very nourishing uh, activity. OK, we have a question for you here um, and then I will just ask you about your book and, and we'll finish off. But from Tracy, um, she said, have you ever predicted someone's future, <clears throat> excuse me, with tea leaves and it's come true? Well, it's, it's funny, actually, because I've done. I mean, thank you, yes, thank you, Tracy. Um, it's funny. I, I have done quite a lot of tapiography and I'd love to actually dedicate some time to doing a full book on it because I think it gets seen as um, something quite flimsy and that, um, you know, people don't really fully understand it because, I mean, even in my book, I, I hadn't got the space to dedicate a really full, full chapter to it. But it's a fascinating study. And I've actually done much tea reading. Um, and you really have to tune into that uh, activity. And I've read other people's tea leaves and I've read my own. And I've actually found that not every time, because it's sometimes your interpretation, you don't always see the meaning of something at that time when you read it. So you'll get something appearing. And you're like, well, I, I, I don't think. And then months later, you realise what it was referring to, because it's not always a literal um, interpretation. And, um, you know, we can also look for the absolute literal meaning of something. And sometimes you have to just broaden it a little. But yes is the short answer. Um, I have, and I've, I've seen it actually. I mean, it's actually quite interesting how you don't just get one little thing coming at the bottom. And I know there are the fortune cups, and I don't use those. I use a plain white teacup. Um, and you are reading the whole of the cup. That, that's what you're doing. You're actually reading the whole of the tea leaves, not just looking for a picture. You need to read the whole thing. Um, and if you do that, 
it can be quite insightful actually so it's, it's a fascinating study it is an absolutely I could do a whole talk on just tassiography. Wow well maybe that will be for another time because it's really interesting it's great to hear your stories as well um, of all the tea uh, histories that you've told us this evening and um, just before you go um your book yeah let's see yeah, there, there it is um so um it's a, it's available i published through pen and sword uh, who are my publishers um and they do an absolutely marvelous job of, of me just constantly wanting to fill it full of everything. Um, but it's available through Pen and Swords website. It's also on Amazon and it's on Waterstones as well. Um, and I believe that they're doing hard back at, at 1999, but I think there's also a paperback out now. I'm not sure. And I think there's a Kindle version, um, as everybody has digital versions now. Um, but it covers uh, literally everything from it's a very British history it's a very dark history as the name suggests but it covers everything from the opium dens through to these pleasure gardens and the art of seduction um, and everything in between and there is a little bit at the back that just um, tells you about some of the things that went on through um, tea um, and smuggling and some of the murders that have gone on and um, all, all the rest of it. So it's quite a good read. Um, my aim was to keep it very different to the other tea books that have been out because there are some fabulous tea books out there on the market. They very much look at the global history or a particular historical element. Whereas mine is very much something, if you like a bit of intrigue and a little bit of the dark side of history, then, then that's your read, really. <laughs> There's my pitch. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, it sounds really great, actually. The person that we had on last week, um, I think she, uh, no, the week before, sorry, Katie, she said she bought it because um, she's a huge tea fan and a tea expert. So, yeah. So, um, but I think even if you're just interested in history and the history in Britain of those times, um, like you said, tea. It covers so much and it tells us so much about what was going on, the politics and so on. Uh, Saren, I would love to join you for a cup of tea in your wonderful uh, tea, yes. uh, tea place there. Yes, the yes, my tea corner. <laughs> tea corner. Thank you so much for joining us. It was fascinating yeah. to talk to you. And um, thank you for everyone for joining us this evening. Um, oh, one. There's another question. Oops. Okay, getting it in there. Um, please do a talk on reading to you. So there you go. Thank you. I will do. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm finally getting into social media. This is a big challenge for me because I, um, I just like to hide away in my tea corner with all my teapots and all my books, really. Um, but I am getting into social media. So um, I'm doing Twitter at the moment. So I'm Seren Food Historian on Twitter. So, um, yeah, I, I will get round to doing a tea talk at some stage just about tassiography. So, you know, just just follow social media and I will. Um, I'm trying to do it every day. I have somebody that tells me off if I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you thank you so much, Sarah, and have a lovely evening. And thank, thank you. you. And thanks to Shahira for manning uh, the Zoom tonight and um, letting you all in. And uh, we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.